Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Shadia Nasrallah. I'm an oil and gas corporate correspondent for Reuters news agency in London. I cover everything uh, across sort of the barrel, but mainly where climate and oil intersect. And I cover quite a bit of uh, oil and gas M&A as well. So uh, welcome to all of you to our one hour session about uh, the cost of retiring oil and gas assets and uh, infrastructure and the uh, financial solutions that are available to cover that cost. So we're looking at a potential funding gap of billions of dollars, if not more globally. And hopefully we will shed a bit of light uh, today on the question who will pay for this and how. Uh, are we looking at a regulatory failure? Why aren't there similar laws for uh, covering the cost of uh, decommissioning oil and gas infrastructure as there are in the nuclear industry, for example? And um, how can investors um, that are uh, dealing with oil and gas make sure that the producers that they're dealing with uh, have secured adequate funding or who is ultimately going to cover that cost. So today we have uh, two speakers. Um, each will give a 15 minute presentation followed by a Q&A session of about half an hour, a bit less. Uh, first up is uh, Robert Schuwerk. He's the North America Director at Carbon Tracker. So Rob leads Carbon Tracker's data provision, provision to the uh, Climate Action 100 plus shareholder initiative, which I'm sure you're all uh, very familiar with, um, which have been very active. Uh, and he regularly talks to uh, financial market regulators about how to improve accounting for climate risks. In a previous life, uh, Rob was an assistant attorney general in New York State uh, and went to uh, Yale Law School. And today he'll talk about uh, case studies about onshore decommissioning in the United States, uh, a bottom-up view uh, of the issue and the costs involved and who's ultimately on the hook uh, to pay up once these uh, assets stop producing. Second up, we have uh, Julien Alphon, uh, who's the head of pensions and corporate solutions at BNP Paribas Asset uh, Management. Julian designs uh, financial solutions for pension funds and insurance companies. So uh, the big money that thinks long-term, they uh, need to know about these risks. Uh, and he has extensive experience in asset management, investment and consulting. And in previous lives, he has worked with uh, Mercer, Lazar, Goldman Sachs, as well as the F French finance, finance ministry and the European Commission. So Julien, uh, in the second presentation, will provide us with a, a top-down view of the costs across different industries globally. Um, we're talking huge numbers here. Uh, so there's, Julien will talk us through some estimates that uh, are about half a trillion dollars globally across different industries. And uh, we will uh, hear a little bit about how it might be that producers and their accountants are underestimating that cost. Um, that should lead us neatly into the Q&A session. Uh, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So uh, please use that, but uh, that button to uh, ask your questions. Please introduce yourself and I'll do my best to channel as many questions as possible to Julien uh, and Rob. And uh, we will also be joined in the Q&A session by Mark Lewis who is the Global Head of Sustainability Research at BNP Paribas Asset Management. Um, he works with Julien and uh, is uh, around uh, with us for the Q&A session to give a sort of helicopter view about how this whole DECOM theme fits in a broader, bigger context as the oil and gas industry um, is you know, settled with huge debt, especially after this quarter, if you look at the majors. Uh, and uh, it looks like peak oil demand is moving ever closer to now, basically. Um, bit of logistics, uh, apart from the Q&A button, um, this session will be recorded uh, 
uh, by Carbon Tracker and will be available um, afterwards. Uh, the presentations will also be available. Uh, please ask Margarita or Helena from Carbon Tracker if you'd like uh, those for uh, yourself. And uh, as a final thought, uh, there will be a second webinar on uh, this theme of uh, oil and gas decommissioning, the costs involved and how and how to pay for it and who is on the hook for it on September the 16th uh, with uh, Reuters events. So we hope that we can welcome you then as well. There'll be a few more speakers and uh, presentations from regulators uh, and other people. So without further ado, I uh, give the mic to Rob. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shadia. Uh, and great to be here with you, Julian and Mark and, and everyone who is <clears throat> uh, listening in today. So. I'm going to try the the impossible, which is to share my screen here. Yeah, uh, maybe successful. Okay, let's see. Uh, Shadi, can you see that? I can see it. Yes. Okay. So I can see your whole screen now. Ah, my whole screen. Okay, let's see. As in your whole PowerPoint. Yeah. Let's see if we can try. Let me let me try one more time. Yeah. Well, let's see. No. Okay, there, we, uh, we, have I finally sorted this? That looks good, thanks. Great, okay, well, well thanks again everybody for, for being here. Um, today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about a bottom-up study, as Shadia mentioned, uh, from, uh, that we published in June, it's called It's Closing Time. The huge build to abandon oil fields comes early. Uh, just as a quick overview of the subject. So the, the first point is that every oil and gas company has uh, asset retirement obligations. These are things that are accounted for in their financial statements, uh, but they're not necessarily things where money or cash has been put aside to solve them. So it's an end of life legal obligation. It involves decommissioning the infrastructure, remediating contamination and restoring the environment to its state before it was, uh, you know, before it was, it was drilled. Um, the liabilities are primarily owed to governments, but governments Although they have the ability to ask for some kind of financial assurance or security to cover those debts, largely have not. Uh, there was a study uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, from the CCST in California, uh, which, which suggested that there was about $107 million in bonds in the state of California to cover something like $9.2 billion in costs. Uh, and so you can see there's a substantial mismatch and that lack of prefunding, I know, is, is one thing that Julianne is going to talk to a little bit later in this presentation. I think one of the key things to note is that when companies default, oftentimes those wells become what's known as orphans, meaning there is no responsible party to pay for them. Uh, in places like the United States, there are rules vary jurisdiction by jurisdiction as to whether the state can seek payment from prior owners, uh, but in many cases they cannot. And in other cases, even when they can, as a practical matter, there's just no one there to pay. So when you look at the financial statements and you look at how those are presented, essentially, what do you get when you're an investor? You get information about these asset retirement obligations for sure. You get typically the discounted present value of those obligations. Now, the discount rates are, are in the United States, at least under FASB, uh, credit adjusted rates. So they may vary across companies and therefore understanding really which company, you know, you can't, it's, it's difficult to compare without knowing uh, what those discount rates are. Um, but even looking at just, just the top line numbers today, we went through this with, with various six, uh, oil and gas SIG codes you can see right there. They amounted to about 9% of the market cap when we looked at this last year. So they're pretty substantial on a discounted basis today. Uh, and when we look at, at uh, the, the, the accretion of these liabilities over time, our estimate is that really the undiscounted values are probably two times that. Um, 
the last thing I'd say is, you know, there are some segmented disclosures about these. And one of the things that comes out are, are you can see, are the revision rates. So how often does a company revise its estimate of its existing liabilities? So forget about adding new liabilities or, or the you know, liabilities you can take off because you've settled them. Um, but the revision rates are quite substantial and they suggest that it's often difficult to, to estimate these liabilities. And that should come as no surprise, frankly, because what are these? These are uh, liabilities that when a company drills a well, it estimates how much it's going to cost to close it, which means estimating how much it's going to cost to close it 30, 40, 50 years from now, not knowing what condition it's going to be in at that time. Now, these liabilities that no one's ever been saving for them and that has never seemed to be a problem because uh, the idea was that the industry would go on forever and there would be future cash flows and those future cash flows would be able to settle these liabilities. The energy transition calls all that into question. Um, you know, in the very near term, you can see in the United States, we have, uh, uh, you know, shut-ins, temporary shut-ins as they're called. Wynn McKenzie estimates that for a lot of these uh, deeper shale wells, it may cost up to half a million dollars per unconventional well to actually get these started again, depending on how much equipment has been damaged uh, in the interim. Uh, but even prior to the coronavirus, we saw a trend suggesting that uh, there, there was you know, increasing risk to states and other governments that there was uh, gonna be a lot of orphan wells that they would ultimately have to address. And you can see the statistics down there at the bottom from British Columbia and North Dakota. Really, I think the simplest way to think about this is that the, the lack of bonding that we have in the industry has created moral hazard. Um, companies have every economic incentive. It's completely rational to delay retiring assets as long as possible. Um, uh, and even as, as uh, organizations like Reistat have written about publicly to operate uneconomic wells for the purpose of postponing that retirement date. Um, they also have every incentive to pass wells that are near the end of their life to less credit worthy companies. Uh, the reason for that is because states typically don't penalize those companies for their lack of credit worthiness. So if you imagine, you know, for any given well, for any given well, some set of cash flows, uh, if both companies think those are the same, but one has a lower expectation of ever having to actually pay for the closure, they may value that well more highly. Um, this can be fixed by requiring full bonding up front, uh, but requiring full bonding requires you to understand what is going to be the actual cost to retire these wells. Uh, and that's where our paper kicks off. What we're really surprised by were comments like this you can see in these top two bullets. So in the first one here, it, you know, it's uh, an estimate from some Baker Hughes engineers that are looking at uh, ballparking what it's going to cost to plug and abandon a number of wells in some of the deeper shale plays. Their estimate is $33,000 uh, per well based on a set of orphan wells from Texas. Um, Rystad models something similar in the 20 to 40K range, so in the tens of thousands of dollars for these wells. What we have seen is that looking at the data is that these are, are, are likely far too low. And why? Uh, just to cut to the chase, it's because they're extrapolating the cost of closing very shallow orphan wells that are selectively closed by the state in an opportunistic way from deeper wells where there's really, frankly, not very much data at all. So you can see here in the blue, that's the vertical depth, which is what's, what's being evaluated in the, in, in the prior slide, uh, you know, of, of various shale plays. And they're all, you know, between 7,500 and 10,000 feet in depth. But frankly, uh, some of these actually have vertical depths that go far deeper if you get into, you know, the, the uh, Permian Basin in New Mexico and some other places, gas wells off kind of quite deep. So these wells are quite deep. <clears throat> Now, I think it's fairly well known uh, that drilling costs bear a, um, basically an exponential relationship with depth. So the deeper you go, the more the cost per foot increases. Uh, and that's one of the things that we noted. This is a study of some wells, I believe in Oklahoma, from our report. The interesting thing is uh, we were able to find some data. This is out of Australia, uh, looking at PNA completions as they were put. So they were the plugging and abandonment of wells was that uh, 
vertical depth, uh, cost per depth, uh, has a similar exponential relationship when you're talking about plugging and abandoning wells. It's just not as steep as the relationship in the in the context of drilling it. Um, and you know, this makes uh, sense in the sense that uh, the deeper you go, the more possibility, if nothing else, you have of something going wrong. So you have the contingency factor, uh, but also just the time it takes uh, to, to, to keep a rig on site to do what needs to be done. So we're actually able to find a number of data sets here. We found data sets from Wyoming, Ohio, and Australia. Uh, and the Wyoming and Ohio data sets dealt with orphan wells. Uh, typically their profiles were shallower, uh, although not entirely. Um, and, and, but the one in Australia we liked the most, and I can tell you why, uh, without getting into too much detail. The ones in, in, in Wyoming provide no information at all about what was done to plug and abandon those wells. So we don't know whether it was, you know, somebody was, uh, you know, a, a can of cement in a pickup truck uh, or not. Uh, the ones in Ohio provide a, a, a fair amount of detail, and you can find this publicly, uh, that looks at, you know, exactly the engineering specifications for what needs to be done to plug the well. And the ones in Australia had a significant breakdown of costs, largely because the regulator there uh, does require a substantial amount of plugging uh, detail to be provided to it after a well has been plugged. Interestingly enough, the, you know, the Australian data is the, the highest cost, but I would note that <clears throat> unlike the other data sets, one of the one of the most significant costs of plugging and abandoning a well is just mobilizing the rig, getting the rig to the site to be able to, uh, you know, and the time it takes to, to move it there, to move it back, and of course the time that it's on site. But all of the wells that were plugged, pretty much all the wells, as far as we could tell in Australia that were plugged were dry holes and they were plugged immediately after being drilled. So you have, you don't have 30, 40, 50 years of contamination erosion to deal with there, nor do you have uh, rig mobilization costs. Hi Rob, Shadia, sorry to interrupt. Um, no, you've got about three minutes. That's perfect, I'm almost done. So just, just moving on here, you know, what, what we really came to in our, in our calculation is that if you want to plug a well that's about 10,000 feet deep, okay, so something like uh, these deeper unconventional wells, you're looking at something more approximating $300,000. There are certainly wells out there that are $33,000 to close, but those are much shallower wells. Uh, and so I think that's valuable to include, uh, to, to keep in mind. Um, and even then, we think that this estimate might be somewhat conservative because it excludes a number of things. Uh, the obligation to reclaim and restore the land, uh, outlier wells. So we do have some evidence from a, a number of closures that Cabot had uh, you know, that you had wells that cost over almost a million dollars to close in today's dollars, uh, three wells. Uh, there's not a lot of detail on what would need to be done. Um, you know, what we're looking at is assuming that closing uh, a well with laterals is essentially the same as closing one with, uh, you know, just, just, just a vertical. Uh, and then, of course, state-specific requirements can change things. I think that's, that, that's right. And I think it's also important to keep in mind that we were just looking at plugging and abandoning onshore wells. Uh, these obligations extend to midstream infrastructure, to downstream assets, neither of which are typically actually even accounted for in the financial statements uh, because their, their useful lives can't be reasonably estimated. And so they're largely excluded. So it's an important element of, of actual financial obligation that doesn't even appear anywhere on the balance sheet. Um, countervailing issues is that there may be ways to introduce cost savings uh, in a number in a number of places, uh, but those need to be explored, and they need to be explored by confronting people with what the costs are. So the question is who will pay? And there's really kind of four different options right here you can see. But if it's not industry, it's going to be the taxpayers or the states. And if it's not them, it's going to be essentially the environment and the landowners. And you can see that abandoned wells that aren't plugged are, are a significant emissions issue. Uh, on top of it. Um, and I will stop there. Thank, right. thank you, Rob. Right. So, so uh, it's now Julian's turn to tell us a little bit more about uh, how much money is at stake and uh, how we might pay for it. Thank you. Well, that's going to be an issue. Uh, I'm, I'm actually almost picking up where Rob has, has, um, has uh, finished in, in, in practice. 
So, um, as you mentioned, I'm from BNP Paribas Asset Management, and um, our view is that, uh, a little bit like for pensions, um, we believe that the uh, decommissioning costs for not only oil and gas, but also for nuclear, for uh, mining and for traditional power, will have to be picked up by someone exactly where almost where, where Rob left off. We, we've done a small study in, in May um, and we, we, we noticed that um, based on our estimates, and it's, a top, it's, it's really a top down compared to uh, Rob's estimate, which is really more bottom up, um, we, we realized there were roughly 3.6 trillion of liabilities essentially in North America, Europe, and Asia. It's true also that the data for South America and Africa are a bit more patchy, so it's maybe we underestimating those, those values. We clearly underestimated the amount for uh, onshore oil, so we know that the numbers that uh, Rob has, has mentioned are probably have to be ad added to the numbers we have here. What, 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 do, what do we see? We see that over 3.6 trillion of liabilities, so environmental, the commissioning, remediation, rehabilitation, restoration liabilities, all those things that come with mines, with oil and gas offshore platforms, with onshore um, terminals, with uh, nuclear power plants, and we, with also coal power plants. About 3, 35,000 coal mines, so to give you the, the idea of the extent of the, biz, the problem only for coal, and out of the 29,000 um, estimated um, power plants, about 2,000 are coal, coal powered. And um, more and more are being built in, in China, for example, Indonesia, more and more um, coal power plants are being built. And as far as we know, it's only the nuclear sector, which has a, a, a which has different type of regulations, but most of them um, require some sort of pre-funding for the um, decommissioning. You have here and there sort of anecdotal stories of oil and gas or mining companies which have pre-funded, but it's really, really rare. In, in, in a sense, um, or nuclear and coal and uh, mining represent majority, uh, oil and gas uh, about 14%, for, for and um, coal power plants another 6%. So you, you really have big, big numbers. Um, I just want to mention that in our estimates, the 3.6 trillion is really, really uh, low. Um, we, we know that there are other sources that we, we have looked that can, can um, easily increase by 20, 30% in total, depending on the assumptions you, you're taking. Um, what are those costs uh, made of and what are the risks around those costs? I mean, beyond rep reputational risk, you, you see um, three, uh, let's say, main types of, of costs. Let, let's, let's, let's be um, sort of very... Uh, high level here and go down to the potential issues with uh, not pre-funding and how would we get advantage of pre-funding. First of all, most of the costs are in program, program management, uh, basically um, planning for different phases, execution of uh, closing down a, a, a oil rig or a, a mine or dismantling a, a nuclear power plant and managing the waste. I mean, the fuel, fuel, waste fuel management is, is one of the biggest um, sources of cost. But um, there are beyond, but there are a lot of operational capa capabilities. So what, what you see here is an estimate or estimates where everything goes well. So if suddenly there are uh, a lot of uh, sort of um, a lot of um, different nuclear power plants or oil rigs or mines that come to um, um, to closure and to dismantling and decommissioning at the same time, there can be a massive rec so tension on the actual capabilities and of uh, the market operators. Secondly, all those estimates have been made with very high um, sort of flexible um, safety um, assessments. Uh, as we've seen, the regulation has changed the last few years and they become uh, stricter and stricter. So those costs can um, increase because of the second part, really the regulation and safety measures that suddenly becomes really stringent. But one of the um, interesting aspects is that all those estimates have been made with an idea that you will find the people that can decommission. Actually, something which is probably one of the most pressing issues is that a lot of people are not trained to dismantle nuclear power plants. I mean, you're more trained to build them. You're more trained to set up a oil rig or to dig a, a mine, but not to close them. It's not, it's, there's really an asymmetry here on um, uh, actually education and training resources. So we do believe this is one of the areas where most cases uh, labor force costs would be between 15 to 25, 30 percent of of the estimates of total cost, but those, those costs can suddenly shoot up if there's no one available. Then you have to literally start training people or pay a lot more the people will be available. Finally, uh, in terms of financial aspects, and we'll come back to this, 
uh, not funding as a cost or funding out of cash flow as a real cost. We'll come back to this in a few minutes. Um, the other point I'd like to mention is that the type of um, decommissioning strategy will strongly influence the way um, you, will, you will actually tackle those issues. Um, one of the, the first um, important aspect is that you do, you're not always um, off the hook once you paid for dismantling a, 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 an old rig. I mean, you have cases where you close down, you abandon the plow, you plug the, the well, but then suddenly you have to take out the top, the top side, I mean, literally take out the top. It's really uh, quite impressive to look at what um, the specialized boats can do and really take out the, the top of the um, oil rig and move it either to be scrapped uh, in, other, in, in, in a country uh, quite far, sometimes thousands of kilometers away from the oil rig, or being reused somewhere else. I've seen this in, in some, some cases. But this is quite a heavy way of doing it. And financially, there are a lot of implications. Like uh, have also changes, as I mentioned, of regulation or simply norms and processes to, uh, to be followed. A lot of um, problems arrived recently in strategy when it comes to um, local and national policies. Uh, Germany and Sweden, for example, decided following Fukushima in Japan to close down their nuclear uh, sector completely, uh, including like all the nuclear power plants. And it's called early decommissioning. This cost a lot more money because suddenly, and as the title of our uh, uh, of our seminar, webinar is, is indicating suddenly a lobby that was supposed to be 40 years in the future or 30 years in the future is coming much closer and then you have to mobilize the financial resources immediately. Again, the workforce work for deputies, if you don't plan for that, that will impact the cost and the, the way you are going to dismantle. Finally, I would like to mention two, uh, a, a problem that's really completely overlooked. Those things, uh, those liabilities are massive on a number of um, companies' balance sheets, uh, oil and gas companies, other energy companies. Some companies, frankly, are technically bankrupt uh, if you take only the amount of liabilities they will have to pay, especially now with the old price so low. Uh, it's kind of, that doesn't, the, the numbers don't add up. I mean, if you have to meet billions or even hundreds of millions of, um, of, um, of the commission liabilities with a very low oil price, there's gonna be a real issue. There are some mitigating factors, uh, potentially, uh, collaboration between uh, all companies that will make a decommissioning campaign in some for North Sea, for example, or uh, the Gulf of Mexico or California, much more cost effective. Also, technology can, can improve, but this is not what we've seen so far. So what are the, the choices when you, you will find this decommissioning from a financial standpoint? Well, you have two, two possibilities. You can either decide that everything should be paid out of your operating cash flow. So if you're an oil company, it will, depend on, it will be dependent on how much oil you, you are going to sell. Or you can create an, an investment reserve, simply a decommissioning fund. This is really something that all nuclear, the nuclear sector in most of the Western world is doing efficiently. Billions of money uh, funds have been invested over the years to prepare for um, post-coming decommissioning. But uh, the two choices are, are quite, um, quite easy to, to compare. Let's look at operating cash flow first uh, in terms of uh, performance of oil uh, prices. If you see those two graphs, we, we took two graphs comparing oil prices, spots, to the S&P 500, or equity markets, and US treasuries. And we took two starting dates, uh, 20 years from uh, last 20 years, December 99 to, um, to now, to, to May, actually it was late, late, of May, late May, and December, 89. So we gave 20 and 30 years to the markets, see what will have happened. But you can see over 20 years, you're slightly better, I mean, especially because the oil prices collapsed, but you're slightly better the performance of the um, uh, S&P 500 in, in, in gray and the US Treasury in dark blue are slightly higher than what you will have gotten from the oil. So over 30 years, over 20 years, you are slightly better. So you could have, if you had been investing for the last 20 years in a small investment reserve, you will have had a little bit better returns from the markets. But over the, uh, over the period, you can see that in, for example, 2005, 2007, you had a, a massive rally in oil prices. So you will have be, been able to capture some of the excess return in oil to pre-fund over the long term. So it's good, it gives you a good diversification in that case. And in the, investing in investment reserve is not, uh, in that case, a, a mistake. It's just the fact that from operating cash flow, it may not be enough. If you look over 30 years, the, 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 the image is even more um, sort of um, obvious. The, on the right side of the, of the graph, you can, or the slide, you can see a graph 
where the equity performance has been very high over 30 years and even, even the bond performance. So investing in investment reserve and investing, taking, as they say, the money out of operating cash flow is not a most efficient or effective way of preparing for decommissioning over the long term. But if you compare now um, all the costs and all the aspects of um, operating cash flow against um, pre-funding or against an investment reserve, there, there are other costs behind this. First of all, or they say other constraints. First of all, from a pure decommissioning liabilities, we know that sometimes you have 20, 30 years in front of you. So you have the time, you, you, you give basically the market the time to uh, so accumulate the critical mass in some ways to, to reach a level of returns 10, 15 years that will really uh, reduce your decommissioning cost. Uh, whereas if you have to pay a lot of free cash flow, you don't know what's going to be, what's going to happen next 20 or 30 years. At the same time, um, it may be that you have a massive operating cash flow. That's, your operating cash flow is very, 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 very high, and then you, you can pay. So it's the quantum and the sort of when those um, decommissioning cash flows are due. So th this really impacts the decision in the end. The costs themselves are quite interesting to compare. On one side, you can um, basically count, count on your balance sheets. You are funding out operating cash flow. So any cash you have on balance sheet would be invested into more oil, more mining, more uh, power plants if you can. And technically, I mean, those returns are expected to be in around the 15, 20% a year, much higher than what you would get on the market. But then you may hit a bit of a uh, roadblock where if the returns are, that you have on, from your own balance sheet investments are not as high. So you could be, from a return standpoint, you may be not as uh, performant. I mean, it, may, it may not be um, as, uh, as, a, uh, as effective to invest uh, just from your, uh, uh, on your balance sheet and try to fund only for operating cash flow. Uh, I, uh, as we've seen- Hi, Julia. Oh, yes. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. You've got about a couple of minutes. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Shalia. That's uh, what I need. The, the other two points would be the cost themselves. I mean, normally, if you don't uh, pre-fund, you have to keep in place some um, letter of credit, you know, some, some, some sort of bank guarantee, some sort of financial guarantee that um, you, will, you will make good on the, on the payments. They have costs, and they have to be renewed on a one or two years, and they can be, you can draw on them if they're not reduced. You can get the cash. But this is pretty expensive, and it's really short-term funding. Whereas investment reserve would be a long-term funding. You can either use contribution annual basis, get cash out of your balance sheet, or potentially issue a bond that will pre-fund this investment reserve. And this is typically the type of risk you're you, you, uh, facing if you do not uh, pre-fund, is that one day to the next, the oil price collapses. You have very little funding capacity on your balance sheets, your operating cash flow is going down, and your cost of using letter of credit shoots up because you become a risky um, potential uh, counterparty for the banks. So all those uh, Ross cost, risk, and returns have to be compared to make a decision. We see, to conclude, we see that the pre-funding is the solution. You get a much better flexibility and you can really match your liabilities by structuring your investment reserve in a way that really closely matches how much you have to pay on an annual basis. Whatever happens on the old prices, if you have a reserve, it's going to be some sort of um, soften, I mean, mitigate the blows of suddenly fall in oil prices or energy prices or mining the commodity prices. Also, it uh, reduces quite extensively the pressure that you have on your balance sheet to have those massive liabilities. Uh, also, the pressure on the operating cash flow to also to be able to meet them. Last two, three points are very specific is that um, if you have a big liability on your balance sheet, it's difficult to uh, do a lot of corporate activity, buy, sell things, uh, everything is, becomes more constrained. If you have less debt on your balance sheet, you suddenly more, you have more optionality or more options to, to be more active from a corporate standpoint. Last, uh, of course, this is again pretty much the same line. If you have a big debt on your balance sheet, you are it's, you're pretty pretty much less attractive for an investor. So you better try to deleverage. So reduces you reduce this leverage on your the debt level of your balance sheet. Finally, finally, um, if you um, push back by, for example, issuing a bond to long-term um, debt 
instead of trying to renew a, a, a letter of credit, if you push back simply the short-term nature of letter of credit to a long-term issuance of a bond that will fund your um, your uh, decommissioning risk over 20 years, for example, then that frees that capacity immediately capacity on their balance sheets. So from a, an oil, a mining, a nuclear stand, uh, company standpoint, corporate standpoint, you have here a lot of potential benefits. This is the end of my presentation. Uh, I know we're very enthusiastic uh, about the idea at uh, BNP Paribas Asset Management and uh, ready to take the, the questions with, with Rob and, and Mark uh, on, the, on the topic. Great, thanks, Julien. Um, again, I'd like to remind people, please feel free to uh, write your question in the Q&A box. There should be a button at the bottom of your screen. Um, in uh, the meantime, uh, let's also welcome Mark Lewis from BMP Paris uh, Asset Management, who's the head of global sustainability research. Hello. Um, Hi. While we're waiting for questions, um, I would like to uh, kick off the discussion with a question basically for everyone. Uh, maybe Julian can start because it comes uh, quite neatly after your presentation. Isn't this now, isn't thinking about this trying to close the stable door after the horse is bolted? Isn't it too late to now start funds, pre funding? Uh, decommissioning now for uh, big oil and gas infrastructure? Well, I have, I have two clear answers. It's never too late to save for retirement. And it's exactly the same thing as for, for retirement. And it's never too late to save the environment. So in some ways, the, the answer is no. If, um, if you have only five years before the next expense, or even less, four years, you still can um, accumulate some return from the markets and at least diversify your risk. So it's not only a good good solution for some for companies or let's say sectors which have 20, 30 years in front of them. It's also good for almost immediate uh, costs that can be partially matched or partially reduced thanks to market returns. So yes, um, better, uh, better move earlier than later, but it's never too late. It's actually, you always find a positive by doing a pre-funding, even if it's just for a few years. Rob, do you have anything specific from the U.S. Uh, perspective to add to that? A couple of things I would say about that. I mean, I think that you, you, there, there is a there is a, a, a stratified, if you look at conventional wells in the U.S., there's sort of a stratified position. On the one hand, there's no reason not to start immediately pre-funding and have that as a requirement for any new well anyone intends to drill. That needs to be fully baked into the cost. On the other end of the spectrum, you do have wells, uh, stripper wells, right, that are very marginal producers. It might be quite difficult to do that. Maybe you need a sliding scale solution there. Maybe there is some level of socializing the cost that you need to do. Uh, but then there's things in the middle that are productive wells, obviously already producing today, where uh, some combination of, you know, we focus in our, in our report, we didn't really focus on solutions. So we just use the default solution of the surety bond. But to start thinking creatively about how financially these, these uh, liabilities can get addressed, Hence, hence some of the work that BNP uh, has, has uh, been discussing here today. Uh, the last thing I would say about it, though, the one other thing I wanted to say was the typical, typical, typical progression of a maturing well will be from an E&P company down to one that is sort of working, you know, this, this you know, companies that focus on mature wells. Uh, and, it, you know, there may be, we may be embarking upon a new period of M&A activity in, in U.S. shale. Uh, and there'll be some consolidation into some of the larger companies. Uh, so from the standpoint of, of a state looking to de-risk its counterparty credit risk on these wells, this is actually a prime opportunity to do that. So I can see a few questions now. Um, there's uh, an anonymous question. Um, if you want to identify yourself in a follow-up, uh, please do. I'm just going to read it out. Did you see any examples of regulatory regimes which required pre-funding ARO for onshore or something approximating to that? And what did it look like? I guess that's probably for Rob. 
Um, yes, yeah, so and there are there are certainly so I would say you know every you could think of the you know there being basically uh, you know a, a federal onshore and offshore regimes in the U.S. and then regimes in every oil and gas producing state, right? So there are, there's a lot of variety, a lot of experimentation. Um, you've certainly seen in the last several years, and we, we cite some of these examples in our paper, of increases in, in bonding requirements from states. So you see in, in Alaska, for example, uh, I think they increased uh, their, their basic single well bond to $400,000 uh, per well. So quite substantial. Obviously, the costs are a little bit more uh, are higher. So you, you are seeing some element of, of pre-funding creep in. Um, there is pre-funding on the books, I should say, in many places. The problem is it's just way too low. So uh, it's something like $30,000 in New Mexico, for example, but we can find you plenty of examples of wells that are over 20,000 feet deep uh, in New Mexico. And so, uh, that, you know, 30,000, uh, we don't think is going to cut it at all uh, for those kind of wells. Um, I, I would expect what you will see is you will see states de-risking on this. Um, uh, you know, in, in a number of ways, regardless, regardless of the political preferences of the people in the state, too, I might add. And maybe we can um, move to Europe or other uh, geographies as well, Julian um, or Mark, uh, from a kind of broader perspective. Well, I, I was just going to jump in there, actually, Shadia, to say that, um, and this is not so much a, a pre-funding requ regulatory requirement, but um, a requirement where the state stepped in um, as the process of decommissioning itself began. And, and the best example I can think of uh, with respect to that is the German government uh, stepping in on the nuclear phase out in Germany and uh, having a two or three year long debate with German nuclear power operators. If you remember after the Fukushima disaster in Japan, the German government decided to shut down immediate, with immediate effect uh, nearly eight gigawatts of nuclear power capacity and to phase out the remaining uh, 12 gigawatts by the end of 2022. And that process is obviously ongoing. But what that did immediately was crystallize the question of what is the true uh, cost of decommissioning and the true level of nuclear waste liability to Julien's point earlier, he emphasized the waste element to this. And it was the waste element that was most contentious. Now, I think the interesting thing here is that Germany, generally speaking, is a very conservative country when it comes to accounting standards, when it comes to values on balance sheet and so on. If you care, compare, for example, the level of uh, nuclear liabilities that were carried on the German nuclear op operators balance sheets with um, the level of liabilities for for French nuclear for the French nuclear operator on a per megawatt basis, the German liabilities were significantly higher, and yet the German government concluded, after a lengthy process, that it required an extra 35% above the balance sheet value of uh, the liabilities that the four German, no German nuclear operators or five German nuclear operators were carrying um, in order to free them from any future uh, liability. So in the end, what happened was the five German nuclear operators paid into a state fund um, the total of the liabilities they had on their balance sheet per plus 6.2 billion euros extra. I think they had 17 billion in total and they, they added an extra 6.2 billion, which obviously then comes as a shock to the shareholders. That was a big drag on the share price uh, uh, over the period and a real gap of 6.2 billion that was crystallized in uh, 2016 in the end when that was finished. So that's what can happen if you leave these issues um, to, to fester, and then all of a sudden a black swan event comes along and uh, requires action. Now, the German nuclear phase out was a special uh, situation because of the impact of Fukushima and the, and the politics of nuclear in Germany. But the energy transition can be seen as a longer term uh, black swan in that sense. It is clearly disrupting the uh, nature of uh, the energy industry. And in a way, what we saw in the G German nuclear industry was exactly what um, uh, Julien was, was indicating in terms of the perils of relying on operating cash flow, because of course, uh, the German nuclear operators were already struggling with lower power prices, which were resulting from 
uh, the impact of renewable energy. So that was reducing their operating cash flow at exactly the time these liabilities were crystallized. So I think that's an interesting case study of how this um, can be a double-edged sword if you rely on operating cash flow. Um, so uh, it, it's a cautionary tale, really, uh, for the oil and gas industry as we move forward. Yes. And uh, can we also talk a little bit about, um, and this is a question from uh, Pietro Fonara uh, as well, what about the EU? Um, is there any kind of legal framework that has been forcing uh, companies that are headquartered in the EU to uh, set aside such money? Uh, the question says, for example, EU companies have, uh, that have operations in Africa, are they required to pre-fund locally there or is, it, is there an EU framework? Um, or yeah. are we looking basically at uh, taxpayers either in Africa or wherever the operations are or where the company is headquartered to, to pick up the bill? Well, what is the framework right now? It's, it's a very, again, a very sort of atomized, atomized uh, framework. It depends on the country. South Africa has put in place quite a, a stringent rules about four or five years ago, where anybody who digs anything on the continent or on the, uh, on the seashore next to South Africa has to prepare to pay to fill it. Whatever holes you, create, you, you dig, it's your responsibility. You have to put money aside. It's probably one of the most extreme uh, frameworks. Um, you have a couple of other countries in Africa which ask for local sort of cash funds or balances that can be used to also clean the environment. Another country that I'm just speaking to my mind is Chile, who has been very um, diligent when it comes to copper mines, which are very polluting. Uh, another, another one has a couple of um, um, Asian countries, um, Malaysia and Thailand, for example, have been uh, also trying to put in place uh, more, more, let's say, more structured and well thought uh, pre-funding frameworks. But to be honest, um, nothing beyond nuclear and, and a couple of countries um, is really geared towards pre-funding. We had discussion with a number of uh, uh, authorities in a number of countries, and they all say, "Yes, good, good." But if we impose a levy, at one point that will end up um, with a lower level of uh, profit for those companies, or lower taxes, or unemployment because people are going to fire, people are going to get fired. So there, there are some um, um, some hurdles that have, still have to be negotiated before we, we we can set up a global sort of maybe you led, maybe uh, cop led uh, frameworks where people realize that without cleaning the environment, the energy transition is going to be delayed or will just not be full. Yeah, or you see the North Sea, uh, the British North Sea, for example, a uh, very mature basin, well, now leaving the EU, and it's, it's by no means clear who's going to pick up the bill in m and It becomes ever more complicated who keeps the liabilities, who's ultimately in charge. And then and it's, the North Sea is it's, it's almost easy because there's 50 billion of cost and roughly 50, 60% for the, the corporate world and 20, 40% for the state. So it's almost one of the clearest frameworks. And even for this one, it's complicated. On top of that, there's a rule that uh, anybody who digs should be uh, the owner of the liability. So if a uh, field has been sold, you have to go back to the initial owner. So you may not be able to trace back to all the companies which worked in, let's say, in the 60s or 70s to dig holes there, or even 80s. So it's actually even for this, which is one of the most sophisticated and well, trans well defined, transparent area. Even there, it's complicated. On the other, the other hand, if you look at the achievements of some of the uh, decommissioning of oil, uh, offshore oil, for example, in California, where often the offshore oil uh, platform have been transformed into other wind farms or sometimes um, platforms for, I mean, natural reserves for um, sea life and um, ocean life. They are very big success stories on the other side. So I, it's really interesting that. Uh, you, you have a sort of money producing assets. Potentially, you can have a different one in the future, but you seem to, me to miss the, the um, transition from one to the other. This is really what's missing. This is in some ways what we're trying to, we're trying to uh, address by, by um, helping people pre-fund. This is pretty much the objective of what we're trying to, to do. How many uh, producers have you got? you know, hooked on this? Uh, how do you, do you feel like the industry understands and is is sort of picking up, picking you up on your offer to provide these sort of funding solutions? 
they they are getting more and more um, I would say unseen somewhere in some ways because you not only have the problem of the financial aspect but also you have the ESG aspect and I didn't touch about this aspect when I was discussing and Mark and I have a never ending discussion about this. The fact <laughs> is that if you not only are in a business which is by nature polluting, we ex extracting either commodities or oil from the, the ground is polluting. But if on top of that, you leave aside infrastructure, which are themselves dangerous to maintain, Rob mentioned the, the fact that if you leave those wells unattended, they produce methane, which is actually really bad for the environment. It's a sort of double whammy that you, you're getting. So if you start at least to clean, and I've, we've seen some oil companies, some, um, especially uh, when in the case of MA, you've seen mines, uh, mining companies saying, oh, you have to put money aside. You can, you can really help the overall um, profile of your company from an ESG standpoint saying, look, I've, I know what we do is messy, but because we're cleaning, we, this improves, this actually offsets some of our overall exposure to um, well, basically uh, negative public goods. The, oh, and especially for listed companies. Uh, no, not only, not only, uh, more and more tenders to, for oil concessions um, have to, um, uh, maybe you have, you have to show that you, you, even if you're not listed, you have to show that you are uh, mm -hmm. a good citizen. If you're not, you may not win the, the tender. Additionally, well, what we see at the BNP, and this is something where we really close to both Mark and I, and so our heart and our, our mind in the sense that if you invest your, retail, your investment fund, your really decommissioning fund into ESG and sustainable investments, you can also offset not only purely what is the positive aspect, but also the overall negative impact of your activities on the environment. If you start mm -hmm. to find, find, find renewables through uh, your investment fund, it is a positive. If you start to um, talk about social impact of mine closure by funding hotels or natural reserves or stuff like that, again, it's positive. All those cases, by the way, I'm not, I'm not inventing them. They are, they're happening in Canada, they're happening in Australia. You've seen there's, there's really a, a fundamental change in the way people think. By the way, you mentioned a country which has changed recently, was evolving now, is Australia, where most of the mining rehabilitation costs could, could have put away in the past in the past, mostly uh, uh, sort of covered by surety bonds, which are non-financial instruments, basically insurance. But now the, uh, the Western part of Australia is more and more, you have most mines, it's asking for cash. <laughs> They're saying it's enough. <laughs> We'd rather have cash now and see um, actual investments over the long term. Likewise for, for uh, Canada, which is another area which the changes have happened. Let me um, move on to. Sorry, sorry, I just wanted to jump in because oh, I mean, sorry. both Rob and uh, Julien have alluded to this, but but not explicitly commented on it. And and what I would say is, to Julien's point about the uncertainty, the unknowability in some ways of the total cost of decommissioning in the future. The extra element here is we're talking about in in the case of oil and gas liabilities, facilities that are at risk of, of producing lots of emissions, and. Um, the cost of those emissions, I mean, the carbon cost of those emissions is almost certainly not being included in those decommissioning liabilities. So that's an extra layer of cost here on top of the decommissioning costs we're, we're, we're talking about, which at some point could well be priced as well. And, and to, your earlier, to the earlier question about is it too late, it's certainly not too late, as Julien said, uh, for any of this. But um, in terms of those emissions liabilities, when you see governments around the world becoming much more serious about uh, pricing emissions, uh, that's a new, uh, a new dimension to the story here. And uh, I think it will be an increasingly important one as governments look at pricing carbon going forward. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, let me just get uh, to one question um, from Jonathan Scott. Um, who is asking about drilling waste uh, in US onshore. Um, so he says often this waste has been buried or spread on the land. This means cleanup will most certainly entail pollution that has resulted from the way the waste has been managed. Um, is, is, how do you quantify that? Is that something you look at and 
Well, I mean, you know, I, I think it's very it's very difficult to quantify to 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 provide a well by well cost for that. Um, those are bespoke cleanup events. Uh, but I can say this: I mean, when you do have contamination, if you have that contamination near groundwater, uh, you know, just like it is with a, a leaking gas petrol station or something like that, you are looking at you know multiples of what it would cost to plug and abandon the well. You might be looking at monitoring that goes on for decades. Uh, so really substantial costs and so uh, I should add none of that is included in the estimates that we had it was just okay. pure the, the plugging yeah and uh, another question from Frederick Mulder who uh, is asking about I assume what he means more from the NOC side so uh, state-owned infrastructure versus commercially owned infrastructure so Julian or Mark how do you how does that figure in your numbers did you just look at commercial or do you also look at NOCs and state-owned infrastructure well, we looked at the top down, so everything was included in our, in our, in our estimate of 3.6 trillion. But uh, frankly, I've looked some uh, estimates on both corporate and state owned. I would not say, and pretty much what Rob was saying about the fact that a lot of the costs are not included. I mean, you, you have just a plug and abandonment cost, costs, and then suddenly you realize that you're monitoring this for 50 years. Just to give you an example, I, uh, people are probably not aware of that, but uh, silver mines among the most productive stuff you can imagine in the world. I mean, for the ancient Greek, they were literally the, en the entrance to hell. This is how they were describing this. It was in Spain. Uh, you were get getting, there was such bad pollution when you're opening silver mines that they, they, they left a, a lasting impact on, on, on the mythos of uh, an entire country, civilization. But once you start to clean these things, it takes years upon years to clean them. And you're not um, sort of uh, um, safe from something bad happening. For example, you would not finish cleaning. So then it is a, like we've seen in Brazil with one of the major uh, mining companies, a dam breaks, water gets into the mine that creates an enormous amount of pollution and the costs are to accumulate. So what we've seen is our very safe assumption, both on the well, sort of safe, uh, conserve, I would not say conservative, but say, I, would, I would rather say aggressive assumptions, both from the corporate world and the, and the public world, to um, reassure people. Because if we start to be, to use very stringent norms and processes or if regulation changes, suddenly mm -hmm. your, your, your costs are going to balloon, really, uh, to uh, numbers that are mind boggling. Let me just give you a basic uh, coal mine. Uh, takes 50 years to um, clean up actively. If you leave that to the to nature, it's 200 years roughly. So it gives you the sort of the, try to uh, try to uh, capitalize any sort of risk of 200 years. Then the, the amounts are going to be multiplied by 10, 15, or 20. Uh, what you expect. So we have only a couple minutes left. Maybe I'll um, bunch two questions up, which are a little bit about the kind of well, bunch together the moral and regulatory and financial hazards. So it might not only be a question for oil and gas regulators. Uh, to step in, but if ultimately uh, the taxpayer is on the hook for a lot of this, if the industry doesn't heed your advice, as it were, um, what other regulators might we be looking at? Like, who should, you know, who are you talking to? Who might be become an actor here? Well, I, I can say in, in the United States, when you think about what's going to happen, you can see some of it playing out today. So obviously, there's the, the regulators for the oil and gas sector in terms of the bonding liabilities. If you have companies that default, uh, then you're going to see uh, bankruptcies, right? Like uh, CRC today is a company in bankruptcy. Uh, and it is, uh, you'll see potentially uh, the attorney generals for the states intervene in, 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 th in cases like that. Um, one thing that nobody is accounting for on their balance sheets, but that would be significant in that context, is any contingent liability for liabilities they've sold down their line to somebody else. So CRC is comprised of assets from, from two companies, uh, from Chevron primarily and Occidental. And there's, this, there's a law in California that allows uh, the state to go after prior operators uh, back to 1996, which would include both of them uh, for any liabilities that weren't settled. So I think you can see, uh, you might see legal actions like that, 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 that come back uh, and then bring in, you know, basically the attorneys generals in, in, in areas, certainly. Great. I think uh, that brings us to uh, the hour mark. Uh, there's tons more to talk about but we will have another seminar hosted by Reuters events on September the 16th. We'll have speakers uh, from the investment community 
uh, as well as from the regulatory side. So I hope we can join you there. If you have any more questions, I, there were a couple of technical questions I'm afraid I didn't have time for, but please um, uh, send them to Carbon Tracker. Um, you can find the email in the webinar chat. Uh, and thanks for taking part. Have a, a nice rest of the day. And thanks, thanks to our much. panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.